Hi, I'm Dr. Cindy Dupuy. I have a PhD in learning disabilities. I do diagnostic assessment, intervention, and advocacy. I'm also an adult with dyslexia and dysgraphia. Hi, my name is Kim Sharman. I work with kids with dyslexia and dysgraphia for the last 15 years, uh, kids kindergarten through college. All right, so today we are talking about the figure weight subtest on the WISC-5. By the way, this is also on the WACE-4, okay? Um, and we're gonna, that's kind of our next list is we need to start doing the WACE and go through all the subtests and there's some parallels in there. However, in figure weights, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear that, Kim? Um, trying to compare which is heavier, which is lighter, trying to visualize and understand those concepts. Okay. So that is a reasonable interpretation. What it really is, is algebra. Mm. Okay. And so it's really not about weight. It's about um, a mathematical metric. And we apologize for the light there in the middle, but it's the only way that we can light it up so that you could see the different colors. So imagine that this is a scale, right? Um, and on this side, we have one green diamond equals one blue oval. Over here, we have a blue oval and we have a question mark and you're supposed to decide which of these would go here. And Kim, your answer would be? Of course, D. I'm sorry, not D, <laughs> B. <laughs> you know what I love about that, Kim? Perfect example. <laughs> is you had to stop and double check your work. That's right. Okay, and kids do that all the time yeah. because they won't notice. So this is a different color, different shape. This is um, a mirror of that one. This is a different color of that one. And this is a combination thereof, right? So the correct answer would be B because we know that those are equal to each other, okay? But you can see how ADHD would impact this because- Absolutely. You make it, right. Okay. But now let's change it and let's come up with a slightly different combination. And by the way, that was have, the easiest. That was the easiest of the easy. These get way more complicated. Right. Um, and I have these tiny little pieces that I'm trying to work with here. So now we have a, a diamond and a heart. And on this side, we can have a hex and um, a another blue diamond. And then over here, we might have um, oh. two blue diamonds. And then you would have to figure out what the possible combination could be. And so you might have an answer that looked like, um, well, that's pretty straightforward, but that's- now, I know algebra, but this is- So we know, anyhow, you get the idea. And yeah. this may not be perfect, but you've got an example over here of what balance is. Yeah. And then you've got another thing over here and you've got to figure out mathematically or quantitatively, you would say here that the red octagon is the equivalent of the yellow heart, right? So those two are equal to each other. Right. They're and then if you've got two right. over here, it could be equal to that, right? Because we, we don't know. Yeah. And so you have to you have to think through and they will have a variety of answer choices. And I know I only changed one down here, but that's yeah. the whole idea. Okay. Right. So what do you think it tests? I mean, we kind of gave it away a little bit. Um you're really having to think deeply about comparing, figuring out what the value is of each one of these shapes. And How do I mentally equate things to each other? Now, this is a timed subtest, meaning there's a time limit for you to come to an answer. And if you give your answer after the time limit, you don't get credit. Um, and on higher items, they give you three scales. So you have to look across three scales to figure out what the answer is. Um, and you have to be able to do that mental manipulation. So one of the things that it involves is working memory. 
right? I've got to think about uh, in our example where we had the yellow heart with the blue diamond and on the other side we had the blue diamond with the uh, red octagon. So we say, oh, the... The only trick red is... Red octagon is equivalent weight to yellow. another one. And you have to hold that as you recombine and figure out how you would balance them. Right. Does that make sense? The working memory, holding information in your brain. Okay. So that's one thing. What else? Um, Given the, the mistake that you made early on. Oh, um, paying attention to paying attention the to right it. color shape combination on the bottom. Okay. okay. Then there's something called quantitative reasoning or quantitative thinking. And you want you can give the great origin of the word quantitative. Uh, I don't know that one, one, but I'm sharing. <laughs> All right. Well, it's got the the key word quantity in right. there, right? right? Or root of quantity, meaning amount. Right. And so you have to think about relative value. Right. Um, and we talk about number concepts in in when kids develop math. So there are kids out there that when we ask them to count on their fingers, they'll count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Even if their fingers, I've had kids where we start counting and as I'm folding down fingers, they're counting faster than the fingers that I'm moving. So they're reciting a sequence, but not linking the quantity of fingers to a particular number or value. Um, and so kids, that's a learned or developed skill. It's a developmental skill. And so kids can struggle with relative value of things. Does this also apply to greater than, less than equal signs um, and also algebraic equations where you make things right. equal? This right. all the, it's all the same. This is, in essence, algebra, except we're not using numbers. We're using shapes. And um, instead of using a letter for a variable, we can also consider a shape to be a variable, right? And so kids are having to conceptualize relative value, think fairly quickly, discriminate among the possible answers to kind of find a produce a response. And these get more and more and more complicated with more varied shapes and interactions. So it's not yeah. just the simple ones we did. Right. And we used a really kind of brief example, similar to a training item early in the test. Now, the second one where I actually goofed it up and I didn't have it perfectly balanced, that's okay. And yeah, that's not getting anything away at that point. Yeah. But it's it's that that conceptualization of how can I think of the relationship and equivalence in that dynamic. And by the way, that works in chemistry. Uh, that of course, is, yeah. You know, it's relevant yeah. in other places in the world, right? And so if you struggle with this, I would be wondering about do you under what's your right hemisphere, which is your visual spatial uh, mathematical reasoning, right? Uh -huh. Um, are you struggling because you don't conceptualize quantity? in the same way? Uh -huh. Are you struggling because you didn't have enough time? Are you struggling because you can't hold it in working memory to do the equivalence to come up with the answer? Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Are you um, also, do, do people ever have trouble understanding the differenti differentiating the shapes of things? Um, no. They make them pretty distinct, they but do. kids will not attend to the color. Right. Right. Uh, now, what does it mean if you score really highly on this? I mean, you have great math quantitative reasoning or? You have good foundations for higher level quantitative reasoning. Yeah. Okay? Um, and so there are kids out there that can think very mathematically. I mean, I have kids that I literally flip the page, I hit the stopwatch button and they give me the answer. And I literally don't... I, I don't even write down a full second or they'll solve it in a second or two seconds, right? They can immediately see the relationships. Um, that doesn't happen so much towards the end of the test, but they're still, I have kids that are still relatively quickly when they're looking across three scales, can intuit and automatically see the quantity and relationship. 
Um, oh, I've got another place where this applies. So this is also baking. Like if you oh, have to think about batches and multiplying batches, um, this is also exchanging money. This is also e exchanging um, converting units, right? Like meters to yards. Yes. Yards to inches. That right? is true. Because I, yeah, I had trouble with that. Yeah. And I had to come up with ways to deal with that. Right. And this doesn't necessarily mean, like, if you're good at this, you could still score a zero on your mad minute uh, calculation. Math, test yeah. Because that's not the, that's not the same math as this math. Right. Because that one's retrieval of math facts from long-term memory. And this is more, I mean, the whole reason they do it with symbols instead of numbers is it takes the math component out and kids aren't having to try and interpret interpret number. Right. Because remember, the whisk goes down to as young as six. Mm. So those little kids may not have all the digits and no relative right. value at that point, but can right. do this activity, yep. if that makes sense. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yep. Um, and so it it tells us a lot about uh, how kids might approach mathematical reasoning and where they might have challenges or where they might excel sciences, math, economics, those kinds of things, STEMI kind of stuff. Um, and again, just because you're bad at it doesn't mean you can't build the skill set. That's right. Now, most people will argue fundamentally intelligence is an innate or might argue that it's all innate. And yet there's a really nature versus nurture component in intelligence and we need to do a whole thing on that but um if you come to a task initially and you struggle with it you can go back and build foundational skill sets yep, yep. to improve that ability most people shy away from what's hard for them so they don't work on these skills so iq is just your natural talent but it doesn't mean that you can't get better at all the things that the iq tests i like yes. that Yes, which is why we should be teaching problem solving skills in school. Right. Like good teachers teach kids how to problem solve. How to figure it out, mm -hmm. how to teach yourself, how to get there. Right. And there's different ways to solve problems, different strategies to begin to think about it. And as we teach kids different strategies or different methodologies, they can build this baseline skill set. Yep. That's good. All right. Uh, bye. Bye.